Welcome everybody to another episode of IGN Unfiltered, our monthly interview series where I have the privilege to sit down with the best, brightest, most fascinating and accomplished minds in the games industry. And one of the most accomplished minds is, is here with me here today. Uh, we're in Las Vegas, we're at the DICE convention, uh, celebrating game developers and celebrating this one particular game developer, specifically Bonnie Ross, the studio head at 343 Industries at Microsoft. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, I think it's great to be here. So uh, there's so much to get to. Obviously we're here because, again, the, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences is, in, is inducting you into its Hall of Fame. Does that, has that sort of sunk in for you yet? Is there, does that sort of take on a meaning or is it all just sort of you're kind of in the whirlwind of it? I would say I'm just kind of overwhelmed. I mean, it's, it's such an honor, but when you look at the people that have gotten the award, in the past, it's um, a definitely it's a it's a it's a really amazing group of people, and it doesn't feel like I'm quite worthy. So I'm still kind of overwhelmed by it. So you're the first female inductee. Does that does that mean a little bit more to you? It, I think it means a lot to the industry, you know. And I think you know, seeing this year that Amy Hennig and Jade Redman also got awards, I think yeah. is a really nice um, nod for the industry. Do you hear from a lot of women in the industry who are looking for advice? Are you because you seem you know you're, you've you've done so much in your career? I, I would I would wonder if uh, you you do a lot of uh, mentorship. Yeah, I do. I do within Microsoft, and um, and then also um, when I speak, I also get other people reaching out. And I think that it is I think an important role that anyone takes in the industry. And I think when you're, I think. Diversity makes an, an extra need for that role. So yeah, I think it's part of our roles to be mentors, to bring the next group of people up. How have you seen it? Because uh, you're, you're now, uh, first of all, congratulations, because you're celebrating not only the award, but you're celebrating your 25th year in games this year. I know. According to the notes I was, I was uh, I given. So uh, did, have you seen, have you seen a, 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 a noticeable difference in the, the amount of women in the industry and, and the diversity in the industry in your time? Yeah, tremendously. You know, I think that um, even in the last five years, I think that there's just the whole industry and how we've pivoted. I think there are more diverse characters. Um, I think you're seeing more diversity on stage. I think you're just seeing different stories. I think you're seeing a more diverse perspective. So I, I think we're in a, a really good place in the industry. We still have um, a lot of work to do, but it's been really refreshing to see the change specifically in the last five years. What this is like a super cheesy question, but you know, twenty five years into your career, what, what advice would you go back and give to the year one of your career version of yourself? Oh my gosh! If you could, wow. Um, I would say when I started, I'd never planned on staying in games. It was just a, a year. I didn't think it was really a career. Yeah. Um, so I think if I would have would give myself any advice, I would um, like focus on giving myself more permission on the creative side. Like I really felt my career was going down more of a technical side. And uh, I, I think I stayed in games because it still sat on the technical side, but I would have given myself permission to really explore more of the creative side. I mean, that's why yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. Um, but gosh, if I do that, and then also I would just say, don't sweat the mistakes. Um, because I would say that every failure point has probably been... Um, an opportunity versus really a failure. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, I guess that's sort of a microcosm of life. We yeah. always hope that we can learn from our mistakes. Um, so you were an athlete growing up. Yes. And sports got you into video games through sports games. Yes. Do I have that correct? Yes. So uh, when, when you did finally get bit by the gaming bug and you really uh, got into gaming, what, what were some of your, your favorite games besides Halo? Because I know that, that I know that did have a profound effect. Um, yeah, no, I would say uh, Tetris, of course. Um, I like from back then or from now. From I guess early on. So when you when you did finally, because you know some just as as gaming became a bigger and bigger part of your life, I'm sort of curious what what the formative games yeah. of your no, life and career were. Sims would be a huge um, thing for me. I think The Sims was probably something the first game that I really felt kind of appealed to to me. And then I think like Roller Coaster Tycoon. Um, I would say Myst, but that's kind of early um, on. Um, 
But yeah, a lot were just sports games, which is, it, it took me a while to kind of really think about gaming besides sports or sports simulations. So yeah. I probably would say I didn't really start taking an interest until a couple years in. You mentioned you mentioned The Sims. Have you had a chance to, have you met Will Wright? Yes, I have. Let's see, I haven't had, I haven't had a chance to meet or talk to him. What's, did, did, did I've, I've only kind of... met like shake hands, okay, hello, so, you're amazing, and that yeah, was I'm, it. I'm kind of curious. <laughs> but yeah, it was an amazing handshake. He, he's, yeah, he seems like uh, a completely fascinating person that would yeah. be crazy to to spend any time with. But yeah, the, the Sims was, I mean, that was, you talk about diversity in women in games. Like the Sims was, I, in my memory of, of the Sims was that it was, you know, it was such a huge success. And it was one of the first games really hailed for being super appealing to everybody, not just, you know, yeah. boys or men. I also think, and I don't remember when Lucy Bradshaw was working on that, but I would say that was definitely very inspiring to me back then, um, her role in that, and knowing that there were a lot of women working on that game. And so I think that was really meaningful for me back then. So I'm, I'm curious, do, do your kids play video games? Is they do. Is it big in the house? They do. They play uh, more uh, PC and mobile than they do console. My son plays more console yeah. than my daughter does. Um, I, I, I'm super curious. Are you like the absolute coolest mom to your kids because they they can brag to their friends at school mom runs halo i mean is that do they do they like to play that card with their friends you know i don't think it kind of really <laughs> sank in until um uh, a couple years ago and then honestly i don't think they care like, no they're they just, just it's like, like typical I'm just kids as irritating with their parents to them <laughs> as any other parent <laughs> so uh you majored if i have this correct you majored in engineering no, I started in engineering. Started in engineering. So um, what were your sort of initial thoughts when you're on that track of, of what you wanted to do yeah. uh, with, your, with your life and career? My dad was an engineer, and um, I was the oldest, and he pretty much told me I was going to be an engineer. <laughs> and so I didn't really know I had a choice. My sisters did, so they did not pursue that. So I really kind of went in thinking that I was just going to do what my dad did. And... Um, what I would say that I, it was incredibly challenging um, being in, in engineering. Like there's not a lot of women um, there. And then my third year, I, um, you know, went to my dad and I was like, I, I don't get this. Like I don't get what I'm going to be doing at the end. It's not that I don't get the schoolwork I'm doing, right. but like I really don't understand what I'm going to be doing when I get done with my degree. And, um, really unhappy and that I wish I had something more creative. And my dad then um, replied and he's like, yeah, I hated engineering too. I wanted to do something more creative. And I was kind of like, WTF dad, you know, why don't you tell me sooner? But I think that I am so grateful for that. And he basically helped me pivot to my, my degree that I got was in technical communication with a, a focus, a concentration on physics and computer science. And I would say computer science was the thing that actually made me the most excited about what I was doing in engineering. And and what so what about that when you when you kind of you're figuring out okay, engineering's not quite for me. Let's make this make make this change. What about about the sort of technical writing technical side appealed to you? I will be honest that my dad was just trying to help me salvage um, three paid years uh, of college. Understandable. And so we kind of just did this hybrid. It was a brand new um, major at the time, and so we just looked at all of the um, credits that I had yeah. and then trying to figure out something creative that could do that. So it was actually his idea that he did all the research and found out um, that there was a brand new degree a lot because um, the computer industry was kind of exploding and needed people to work on documentation and specifications. And, and so he helped me kind of craft it. Um, but I would say that um, it was probably more of the design part of the writing that I liked on um, than just the writing writing part. Right. So what? So then, in that version of yourself, what what did you see? Like, okay, what what was your hope to? What did you what did you hope to be doing at some point? When I graduated, my um, I interned at IBM, and the top three places I wanted to, and I I, I did um, interview with IBM, but I didn't at the time, which I think is funny now. Uh, the next closest person to my age was like 15 years older than I was. And so I felt like it just 
didn't feel exciting where my number one company was next. So that was when Steve Jobs had sure, left yeah. um, Apple. Number two was Apple and number three was Microsoft. And um, next and Apple did not um, respond to any of my resumes that I sent and Microsoft did. And so for me, it was all about technology and it was being on the cutting edge of technology. Yeah. And when I interviewed at Microsoft, the average age was 27, I think, back then. And it was so liberating. Um, you know, we're a huge company now, but even at a very, whatever, at 21, I had more responsibility than like my entire internship, two-year internship at IBM. It was amazing. Well, and now, now uh, I mean, Next is gone, but I mean, now who's Apple's laughing they're, they're, they're kicking themselves now. I know, they could have had, had me, they gosh. Had, just you could have done, I know. who knows, maybe Apple would be <laughs> more prominent in the games world than, than they, we keep hearing, oh, Apple console this someday. It, like, no, it, now they're, it's they're lost. All was me, like it could have been so different for Their them. loss is Microsoft's <laughs> gain. But um, see, so yeah, I mean, after after 25 years in, in the business, what do any of the games, we'll talk more about the games you've worked on here in a second, but do any of the games that you've worked on kind of stick out from the others for any reason, like either good or bad, yeah. like sort of just just like rapid fire come to mind. Yeah, I would say like Zoo Tycoon was probably my first when you asked. Like at first for me, it was sports, sports, sports. Like yeah. I love sports and I didn't really see another path um, besides sports. So it was Zoo Tycoon would be the first one that I actually creatively thought about what we wanted to do given my love for The Sims and Roller Coaster Tycoon. So that would be one that I probably would say like was probably most defining, you know, for me. If we look at other ones, I would say Psychonauts is like one of my all-time favorite games. Fusion Frenzy, just because it was the first certed um, uh, Xbox title, so it was the first title to pass cert. And then obviously, I don't Halo. think I knew that. That must be, that's like a fun little trivia yeah. nugget. It was, it was the first official yeah, one that I think when you look at the games that were being on there, it was probably the least complicated. So we were the first done <laughs> and, and able to get through. But yeah, claim um, to fame. Uh, NBA Full Court Press. Oh, yes. That's where you got your start. Am I, I got correct start, on yes. that? Yeah. So what do you remember about that project? And what was your role on it? Um, so I, first off, getting the job, I was over in, I was working on the systems on the operating side. And I just wanted to take a one year break to work on something that I could actually talk about with my friends because no one really cared about Land Manager or OS2 or DOS or anything <laughs> like that. And um, what is just funny back in that time, because I completely wasn't qualified to work in gaming, but we decided we acquired Access Golf that was in Salt that. Lake City. Yeah, the, and, uh, the Lynx. They did the Lynx yeah, franchise. Yeah, yeah. and then um, we decided that we were going to then build a sports PC gaming franchise around that. And so there was a position for the lead producer for uh, the basketball game. And my, um, I played basketball, girls basketball. I assistant coached um, junior high basketball. And I was the most qualified person because we weren't in the game industry. So it wasn't like we were interviewing people who had actually worked in the game industry. And yeah. so I got the job with literally um, <laughs> girls basketball, high school basketball as my um, background. So, um, but starting it was great. It was, it was sort of a co-development. Um, we were working with a dev partner in Australia doing just the, the, um, the dev work, but we were doing all the art, motion capture, and um, like the AI spec design and everything like that. So it was really, sports games is such a great way to, especially back then, because sports games were the first ones to use motion capture. And so for yeah. me, it was a really great like gaming 101. Um, and it was a 2D sprite uh, game. But being able to work on the whole creative side and the design side um, was, was a really, just I think just sports games in general are just a, a great way to in, enter the industry. So what did uh, what, you learn about game development from, from that project? Um, you know, I would say that, again, from what I'd worked on before, just uh, that's where I think for me the light bulb clicked on for, I, again, I said I was just going to be there for a year um, as I didn't really think there was a career in gaming. Yeah. And I think the thing that really clicked for me was when I said before I was looking for a creative outlet that it was technology, like empowering creativity. 
And being able to work on the art side was super interesting to me. And, and it was also interesting working with coaches. You know, so we worked with Del Harris for a bit on going over. And at the time, the way we were doing it, so I, I'm not saying it was a, um, it was a fine PC game. I think it was a 70 rated something. It wasn't um, a great one. But being able to actually sit down with the, and go through with all the plays and actually move that and put it in a spec for designing the AI was, was super interesting for That's me. Cool. And I realize it's more analytical, but um, it was a great bridge for me to move into gaming. So let's see, uh, Dungeon Siege is on your, your resume as two, well. Yeah. Dungeon Siege 2, you mentioned Psychonauts, yes. uh, the Tim Schafer fan, who isn't? Uh, Jade Empire is on your on your, uh, your and these are all like in the, those are in the publishing yeah. role. So uh, and then of course Zoo Tycoon you talked yeah. about um, what are, are there any little things you took away from from each of those or are they sort of how do you sort of see those now in the in the scope of your larger career? Yeah, I think for me. Um, when because we managed such a large portfolio, especially back then, especially when it was PC, yeah. um, we had um, a huge portfolio, and some of the things that I worked on were co-development, which were um, super educational. But it was mainly in the time that you might it might take to develop one game internally. Uh, people on the publishing team would get a chance to work on. 15, 20 games. And so basically having the opportunity to you know, sit with some of the most amazing developers in the industry and learn what they're doing, what, wor what works, what doesn't work. And it really helps you kind of get a big scope of like, hey, you know, can you tell when a game's off track or you know, what needs to happen first or if something's missing, just being able to have that portfolio of you know, 10, 20, 30 games every two years was hugely educational. So it allowed you to, to sort of learn a lot faster, it yeah. sounds like, with, with just more opportunity to kind of soak things up like yeah. a sponge. Um, you mentioned uh, Tetris earlier. You, you got to work with uh, Alexei Pajitnov? Pajitnov, pa yeah. Yes, I can never get that word. <laughs> what, so how did that come to be? And, and I know you kind of regard him as a bit of a mentor. I do. He's, he's amazing. Um, and I would also credit him for I did not want to move out of sports games. Um, I, at the time, Shane Kim, Ed Fries was um, our manager at the time, and Shane Kim was being um, told to start like a new casual games group and was going to work on um, board games, uh, sort of card games and board games. Yeah. And because Shane had a business background, Ed wanted to partner, as an EP at the time, um, wanted to partner us together, and I did not. Um, I was like, I do not want to work on card games and casino games. And Shane was like, neither do I, but like, <laughs> let's just get in here and then we'll have Ed give us some money for some other games. But part of that was when we established that group was Alexi Pajanov coming on and um, Pandora's Box. And what I would say with Alexi is he is a magical person um, and he sees the world in such a visually artistic way that it, 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 it basically ignited, I think, more of my love for things besides just sports and sports gaming. And um, he was just, he was great. He was such an amazing um, person. And when I say a mentor, it was somewhat comical because he actually ended up reporting to me. And, and I, I mean, like I was young and I kind of went to him and I was like, I'm so not worthy. And he goes, oh, I don't want to manage. He goes, just let me do my thing and, you know, that's good. But uh, he was amazing. Yeah, we used to... Um, we used to rollerblade together. Um, he wanted to lose 40 pounds and decided to teach himself to rollerblade. Nice. And so like half of my, what I would say, my mentorship would be on these rollerblading with this crazy Russian. And, <laughs> um, and he was just, everything on even how he saw the world was, it was magical. And I, I think that's kind of why I like Tim Schafer's mind too. I think people that see the world differently are incredibly inspirational. Do you know Chen's like that? I don't know if you've ever had a chance to meet him. He's, no. Uh, but um, yeah, what? So did you start? Did you see Tetris differently at all after getting to know him a bit? Yeah, I mean, I love Tetris growing <laughs> up. I think we all love Tetris yeah, growing up. But Game Boy Killer app. Um, but it was interesting, is you know he has a, a math background, and I went to Russia with him a couple times, which is was also a trip. But um, he has a math background, but it's really interesting on how he doesn't. He doesn't, 
he doesn't see himself kind of as a scientist or a mathematician. Um, he looks at things just visually. I think his life on how he looks at things are a puzzle. So yes, um, on thinking about how he was visualizing Tetris based on just working with them was. Have you, have you, do you keep up with the sort of Tetris releases over the years now as sort of uh, I do, like, like he, like we got to, we had lunch. I mean, I keep more up with following what he's doing, but yeah, I mean, I've played some of the more recent ones. You know, I think that was, um, yeah, he, I spend more time like following him and we had lunch like, I don't know, like seven months ago or last year or something like that. And yeah. he's doing well. Good. Um, so what, at what point do you sort of have the ambition and you're, you're learning about all these games on the, on the publishing side at Microsoft. Uh, at what point do you start to think I think that to have ambitions of being a studio head? Does that, or was it, was, was the, was it something that you sought out or did, did, did it, did it seek you out? You know, it was, um, so over the course of, like, and we all use titles differently because we kind of had, um, I used to manage a portfolio of publishing games, like, so did um, Phil at, this, at, at the time. And um, then as, I think at that time, Phil was took over our Europe uh, um, stuff, and then we, uh, Shane, there was an opportunity to sort of organize differently. I was running all of publishing like I was so I was running production for all internal and external okay. so just managing a huge portfolio yeah. which for me was interesting but not very creative and when it really just came up when um, Bungie wanted to um, spin out that it was like the question of what next to do with Halo and I mean Halo has a really special place in my heart and so um, I pitched for what I wanted, and um, I got the keys to the franchise. And <laughs> that's this, simple. It wasn't that. It wasn't <laughs> quite that simple. Um, no, like so. Uh, when we spun um, Bungie out, it, the future of Halo was uncertain. Um, we weren't actually sure, like, was Halo Three going to be the last game? Because right. you know, Halo, Master Chief specifically sort of left in. Is he dead? Is he alive? And it could be uh, very much the last game. And uh, Bungie was going to work on um, two other games, which then um, we published, 343 published, which is Reach and ODST. Uh, but then past that, there were thoughts of doing one or two other games, actually even doing it externally, just finding mm -hmm. another um, partner to do that. And I went to Shane and I put this proposal together that I pretty much thought that was blasphemy, you know, to do that. And I felt like Halo 1, 2, and 3 took place fictionally over three months. And I believed it was just the beginning. I believed that the universe was like this canvas that um, I think is so rare in the entertainment world. And I put this pitch together on what I wanted to do and that I wanted to build an internal team, which was not part of uh, the plan at that time. And for whatever reason, Shane said a couple of things. You do not want Halo. <laughs> um, uh, why would anyone want Halo? Because do you understand the tax it puts on you? Like everyone wants a piece of Halo. Right. Our company wants a piece of Halo. They want you to do things that maybe aren't right for the game. Um, you're stupid, you know, to do that. But then I was like, no, I really, I really am passionate about this. And um, he gave me the keys. And I, I, I'm not sure the circumstances that would have happened in, in any other place. It was kind of a timing place, but... I feel so grateful. So what what was his, what did he think should happen to it then? Was, I don't the, think there was a lot of thought because I think of it, think of it as looking at it more from a business. Yeah. And then it was time Robbie Bach and Shane were like, hey, Halo's great. Bungie doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, we, I mean, they weren't, it wasn't as, um, I want to be careful, like I, Robbie and Shane are not like people that are thinking just for the money. Um, but they were just basically like, Hey, I think it's um, like it's maybe good for another game or two, yeah. and let's just like cut our losses and like wow. tell another story. And it doesn't. So I want to make sure, like when it's when it sprays, it wasn't they were just thinking about more from a, hey, Halo Three maybe is the end, and um, if it is, then let's just like tell a four story and wrap it up. Interesting. So you mentioned there, there was a thought of before three four th before you sort of pitched three four three and, and taking it on internally. That maybe you get somebody else to come in and make a couple of games. What did it make? Did it make it so far as like 
were, were studio names talked about? Like, who would we want for this? Um, yes. So it's a fun uh, historical nugget for Halo fans. Um, yes, uh, Gearbox was one of the people that were... They'd done the PC in. port mm-hmm. of, of Combat Evolved. Yeah. Uh, so that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, are there, was there another one or two in there? That was pretty much that the one that the, they were going to look at. Having interesting. Them do. I wonder how that would have changed the course of their, yeah. <laughs> of their future. And if we ever would have got Borderlands <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. Well, what, so what was your first interaction with Halo? I mean, I certainly it's Halo one, but what, what was it about it? Like, do you remember kind of the, the, where you were, when? Oh, the, definitely. <laughs> I think everyone does yeah. on that. So, um, I was working on Zoo Tycoon at the time and Fusion Frenzy and um, we had our first E3 when we were trying to move into a console, um, and I think you know that didn't go very well for us. It's, we were basically people didn't believe that we could do a console, that we should have a console. Yeah. Um, you know, when Halo was shown there, it wasn't at a locked frame rate. Like we came in very PC esque, and um, there was huge panic uh, with Halo, and so. They, after that E3, um, we were concerned on FPS on the console, um, on Halo, that it's sci-fi, and would anyone want a sci-fi? So we quickly had Eric Nyland write The Fall of Reach. Yes. And so I, and we all got the book, I think, six weeks before it shipped, or maybe a month before. So I read Fall of Reach before I played Halo. Oh, interesting. And so for me, um, Master Chief Story, John, six-year-olds being abducted, and I'm a huge sci-fi fan, um, that it really kind of took a life on of, it, of its own. Like playing, you know, when you, reading it before you play it, I, I kind of get, it blurs a line of what was the game story and what is the story that I know yeah. of John. And so for me, it was just, it was a rich and deep universe from the beginning and one that I fell in love with, not just like the first time you see Halo or silent photographer or, or, you know, um, anything like that. It was just, I, I loved the universe and I loved the story. And so it was, it was more than just a game for me. Yeah. I, I actually had that experience with Mass Effect 1. Uh, oh, really? Drew Karpishin, the, the writer at BioWare at the time, that they put out a prequel novel before the game came uh-huh. out. And that, I can really relate to that. It was like, it really added to Mass Effect 1 for me coming into that Yeah, game. no, and it's kind of why, like my passion, I have a ton of passion around transmedia because I think it does um, enhance the experience. And we've done good things and made mistakes, but I do really believe that, like there's only so much story you can tell in a game, especially a first person shooter, but there's a universe that's so rich. And if you choose to dive into it, I think our game should be even better experiences so so when you start 343 what's what is the is there sort of one guiding principle or a short list of guiding principles to it yeah when we first started the studio when we first started there was um so we made the decision shane uh, made the decision in fall of um after we shipped halo 3 so fall 2007 yeah. yeah and so then it was trying to figure out what the skeleton team that it had so we just i think um we didn't have anyone, and we just kind of like picked a group. I think we started with like 12 people. And when we got to about 20, we kind of sat back and said, like, we've got to think about what our values are and like who we are as a studio. And we were really deliberate on like team first, being humble, um, meaning that we these are huge shoes to fill. And um, we can't just assume that. So really being humble and really looking at community fans um, first. And so kind of putting values in like how we wanted to show up and that we had to earn it. We couldn't just assume just anyone could take over Halo. And I can tell you, it's not that easy to make Halo. I mean, like even just making Halo feel like Halo, it's it's not that easy. And and I also would say that a lot of the things that... um, we're very obviously we all we all work together with Bungie, so they were really great in helping you know pass that torch on. Yeah, was uh what would was there a sort of a big fear that you had starting it up? <laughs> yeah, it? I'm just that you might fail. <laughs> no, I mean like it's um it's such a beloved um, game franchise that uh, yeah huge fear of failure. I mean like you don't want to mess it up. If I'm asking for it, we either end it at Halo 3, or if I'm asking for the keys to, to take it, it further, got to do it right by the fans. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think that's a huge, 
huge, uh, daunting hurdle to do. So your the first project, if my, this going off my own memory here, was uh, Halo Anniversary. Was this mm-hmm. was that the studio's first project? Yeah. yeah. So you guys worked with Saber Interactive mm-hmm. on that uh, in a sort of co partnership yeah. situation. What what made you choose them out of curiosity? You know, I think we just uh, were trying to pretty much find a work for hire where we could kind of own the creative. And so we just basically wanted a work for hire partner that yeah. had the engineering chops. We were mainly looking for not a lot of design talent, but just technical yeah. talent to, to move forward with that. So they were a good partner for it. Um, what what uh, what would you say was, what did, what did your new team, which I think at that time was still relatively small, small right yeah. yeah what what did the 343 team learn from from that being their first project together of of doing the anniversary remake of Halo 1 and shipping that yeah well it was the first ones would, i would say um, we worked very closely with Bungie on ODST and um, Reach and so i'd say that was kind of more okay. of the first learning and then there was you know when um, when i first started 343 like we obviously had all the code, we had all the assets, but we didn't have the lore um, of that. So Bungie was really gracious that I asked if we could come in and have a company interview them to pretty much get all the stuff that we wouldn't have. Oh, wow. And um, I hired this transmedia company, the time that was working with James Cameron on Avatar, to kind of come in and, and help me think about how, how, how can I be the best steward of this universe and, and like how can I take a step back and really think about the canvas. And, and, and they were really good about saying, okay, as you're thinking about universes, you know, whether it be Avatar or Star Wars or whatever, like think about that canvas. Like what's the first story you want to tell and what's the last story you want to tell? And not in that order, right. but like what's the canvas that you want to st- tell your stories on? And um, that was hugely educational. And then they did a bunch of interviews with uh, Bungie, we put together this huge Halo Bible um, that kind of everyone could onboard, so we could do as good of a job as we as we could without having built the game yeah. to kind of like be what Halo is. Were you? Uh, I should have asked you this sooner, but were you ever? A, were you a multiplayer Halo player as well, or mostly? Were you mostly there on the the single player side? I am mostly on the single player. Like I, I like uh, multiplayer. I would say that I'm definitely more of a firefight um, or Warzone yeah. type player, but. Um, yeah, I do play it for the first week until everyone else um, <laughs> catches up. Me. Um, so, how did uh, w- let's see with Halo Four? I, I I have my opinion on it as far as I'll, I'll tell you in a second because I want to okay. get your take first. <laughs> do you do you think that Halo Four was treated a bit unfairly because you guys weren't Bungie because that was the first major Halo game without their name on it? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not even sure it's it's um, I think we probably should have been graded harder. And, and I don't I just mean that in that like what Bungie created with Halo um, is a it's something that's not easy to it's not like any developer can and can pick it up and um, I think that it would be it would have been hard for us to get reviewed without kind of like we weren't Bungie. Like I feel I feel very proud of, of what we did with, with Halo 4. I'm most proud of the campaign. I think that we, multiplayer, we learned a lot and, and hopefully did a better job with Halo 5. But um, yeah, I think it was just, you're handing over someone's baby, you know, and like making sure that we do a good job with it. So you know, I'm, I'm happy with the game. And I, I think that the press was you know, you've got to look at all aspects of that story. See, because I think it, I think you guys were treated a little unfair. I mean, I I love that game. Oh, cool. You guys, <laughs> you guys know that. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was such a great campaign in particular. But it was I, I saw a lot of that out in the yeah. out in the world of like, oh, you know, just kind of hating, you know, hating on it because it's because you're not, you know, you're not bungee. Yeah. But, but um, we we did have people, if people and um, journalists, I think, come around like years later and kind of say, you know, actually, the Halo Four story was. Really good. Like I, I love the Halo Four story. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm objective, um, <laughs> but it just for for me uh, that relationship so important. Dr. Halsey, like I just love. That. We kind of we have a tendency sometimes at three four three, which we're trying to get better of going uh, a little bit too deep into our story. But I still love the Halo Four story. So uh, Master Chief Collection, how how did how did the 
the issues with that game at launch. How, how did that affect you, both sort of personally and professionally? That was incredibly, incredibly hard. Uh, and to give some background on, um, you know, sort of origin story, yeah. when um, the decision was made to ship Halo 4 at the end of 360, um, originally I pitched it as a launch title for uh, Xbox One. Oh, interesting. And, um, and, and largely, if you look at with um, Halo 3, Halo takes three years to build. So it's a huge game. It takes a minimum of three years to build. And um, when the decision was made to have it be an end of life cycle for 360, it put a huge gap in the launch portfolio. And, you know, I raised those flags, but, you know, it's easier, like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So when we got to the launch, we had a huge hole. Halo wasn't, Halo 5 wasn't going to and Halo 4 wasn't going to be there for the first three years, which is yeah. super hard for launching a new console. So Master Chief Collection kind of came on. We did the Halo anniversary, Halo CE anniversary. Halo 2 anniversary was going to be when we'd be launching with the new console, first two years of the new console. And so the original plan was just to do a Halo 2 anniversary, hmm. just a standalone Halo 2 anniversary. But because... Halo 4 was further out than what everyone wanted. Um, they asked for us to do more. And we also thought about, so it was just kind of go back to the drawing board and think more about what Halo's presence should be on Xbox One. And we kind of came up with the idea of, hey, wouldn't it be great to have all the Halo Master Chief stories on one console? So this yeah. is like a brand new console, but you can catch up with the whole story. So the original one, was, the original was Halo 2. Then it was... Um, all the campaigns, but just Halo 2 multiplayer. And then we probably got a little bit too ambitious and we did it all. And I think that we we did a lot more than maybe we had time for at that time with a brand new console, which I think is is really hard. But that's that's kind of how it got to be that. But you asked the question on, like, how did it feel? It was, it was incredibly um, crushing to let the fans down. It was supposed to be a love letter to the fans. Yeah. And, um, you know, we let them down. Um, it's just sort of on, on that kind of note, like you're, you are, you've voluntarily taken responsibility of, for the Xbox's biggest brand. So it, that seems like a thing that would be a lot of pressure on a pretty regular basis. Do you, do you feel that pressure or do you, is it just your, that's your normal or, uh, do you thrive on it? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> um, I do think, like you said, I, you know, I, I think that many people have questioned, would Xbox even be here today if it wasn't for Halo? And, and so I think that relationship is so um, symbiotic. It's, it's, I, I think you don't, didn't have one without the other. And I think, so I think it is always iconic. You always see Master Chief on all of our Xboxes. And um, I don't think it's, I've only ever worked for a platform company. So I think it's just kind of part of your DNA. It's yeah. not like, and I think that, Together we're better. Like when when the platform and Halo align, I think it's it's better for both the platform and Halo. Um, so let's see. I mean, it, you mentioned actually you, you yourself mentioned the, the three year cadence that we've typically yeah. had between mainline Halos. Uh, that that's now uh, that's now out the window in the sense that we, yeah. we're we're past the three year mark between <laughs> Gosh, between five and infinite. Yeah, uh, it. Did uh, does that does this extended gap have anything to do with how five was received, particularly on the the campaign side, or um, more like so? When you look at um, both Halo Four and Halo Five, um, look at it more as the technology that we have to 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 build the future of yeah. Halo, and so. Uh, we can come back and talk about the Halo 5 stories. I'm sure that's probably one of your questions. <laughs> um, but it really was more um, working. The Halo engine is a very technical engineering focused engine. It's super hard for creatives to work in. Super hard for a lot of creatives to work in um, at one time. And we did a ton of work on Halo 4 on the engine to get it to look as Oh, it I looks think it looks amazing, amazing on for being on, on, the, on the last generation, the last um, year of the platform. Uh, we promised the team that we would do the work 
on the tools and pipeline for Halo 5, so it wasn't such a challenging project to develop, or challenging environment to develop on. And, you know, best laid plans, we didn't do that. And um, the team, rightfully so, basically called us on it, you know. And um, if we were thinking about, you can, you can only do so much on that engine, and you have a team that is incredibly hard to do. So one, we want to do more with Halo, and two, we want to have a team that can do their best creative work within our engine. So it really was taking the time off, and as we announced the Slipspace engine last year, it is all to make sure that we're building the, the platform for the future of Halo. So it was a huge investment, a bigger investment than we've ever done. That engine is, gosh, 18, 19 years old. The, um, wow. And so when you think about the where we are today, we needed to pretty much redo it. And I'm really proud of what we have now, um, but it took a lot of work to get there. Cool. So, uh, so Halo 5 comes around uh, on, on the back of uh, Master Chief Collection's, mm -hmm. you know, difficult uh, time with, you know, you, with, that, 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 was, that was tough. And, and 5 comes around, and I think, I, I, I would say maybe you disagree, but that by and large, the multiplayer was universally beloved. This is a phenomenal multiplayer, and maybe the campaign... Not so much. So what what was sort of the did did any of Halo 5's feedback on on either side of it, uh, you know, single player or multiplayer, take you guys by surprise or sort of and what were the kind of learnings that you took away from from five? Yeah, I, I think that um, I think there were concerns before uh, we launched it. I think that I am super proud of the story we told with Halo Four and. Um, I think that we've done a good job with transmedia on sort of like um, broadening the cast of characters. I think with Halo 5, we kind of might have jumped in ahead of time without really thinking. It's not that we didn't know that Master Chief wasn't, shouldn't be the main um, character. I think we just wanted to bring a cast of characters in, and I think we basically told an overwhelming story. Like I, I, and, I, um, and I think you know there are multiple things we... I think could have done to make it a, a different story. Like I'm really proud of the gameplay that the team put together, but you know, I, I I would say that I think we I think we learned a lot, and hopefully you saw that in the um, last year's E3 trailer on you know making sure that we really we really understand and value on, you know, what Halo is. And I think we branched out. And I think there's always room to tell other stories and side sure. stories. I just don't think that probably should have been a Halo 5 numbered story. And so I think that it's a, it's a good learning to think about. It's a vast universe, and we can tell these stories. But there's also an expectation on a um, with where we left Halo 4 and, and where we went with Halo 5 that I think we... Audiences gave us a lot of feedback. It was definitely not their favorite story. So in Infinite will will be applying those lessons. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think that, like, hopefully we do listen, we do learn. I think that with Halo 4, I think I'm really proud of the campaign. I think our multiplayer um, lacked uh, what we needed. So I think we did a good job with Halo 5 on, on fixing the multiplayer. And so I look at Infinite as we're going to put the whole thing together. Well, and that's it's interesting because you know, I, um, in my opinion, and I'd be happy to, I will debate anybody on this. I I think Halo is arguably the last major first-person shooter franchise that that's still active, that is beloved for both its single-player universe and its multiplayer. You know, yeah. there have been other franchises that have kind of gone one way or the other um but I, I really feel like halo people love it and maybe they love it what you know they're kind of in it for single player and for multiplayer but it, it is beloved in both on both sides of that coin is is that uh that legacy of halo important to you is there uh, or or you know i kind of want to turn this into a a, a conversation about the evolution of of online gaming and games as services. So yeah. I'm sort of curious where you see Halo as far as uh, you know. Do you see it as a responsibility to both a single player universe that you came to Halo for and and the multiplayer side of things that 
that it's, you know, that the, the industry seems to be pushing a little more towards on the games as a service side. Yeah, and I'll step back and answer a, a little bit um, broader on that. I think Halo does serve, I mean, a lot of, you know, we have research on what players um, play, but when you look at what our DNA is and you look at research on people, it, it is a beloved story and it is like a perfectly orchestrated sandbox for a multiplayer um, as well. One of the things that, that Bungie saw as, as much as we do, it's you can't take a feature away from Halo. I mean, we need to be able to, but the audience definitely wants it to be additive, which then, you know, Halo 4, biggest Halo game ever. We promised we were not gonna do that with Halo 5. Halo 5, the biggest um, Halo game um, ever. And so I think it's like, we keep adding things on versus kind of taking a step back and saying, what is really important? And how do we get that right and make sure that we really are focusing on what's the right story to tell? Um, what's the right multiplayer experience? And then learning what we did with both Halo 5 and MCC, we can keep adding things on. You know, like, so how do you kind of look at making sure that with each beat that we are, are doing the right thing? Um, and I think that is a learning um, for us, but yeah, you can't. I don't think you can have one without the other with Halo. I think it is. I'm so glad to hear it's, you it's, say it's, that. It's, it's both. I think, like you know, again, <laughs> story is incredibly important, and so is multiplayer. And we have audiences that you know champion both sides, and then a lot of them that like both of them. I mean, I, it's the topic du jour. I can't not have you sitting here and, and ask you about I mean, battle royale, right? It's it's the <laughs> it's the big thing now. As we record this at, at, at the Dice Conference in Las Vegas. Apex Legends, Legends has, has taken yes. off like a rocket. I mean, the respawn super talented team, and they've got they're over they're like twenty five million total players yeah. right now. Uh, I mean, it, it is. What do you, what do you guys see? I'll phrase it this way: at, it, at three four three, how are you guys looking at that as as uh, yeah. the the you know curators and, and protectors of Halo, and you're responsible for growing the IP, but also and the business like. What, what do you see when you see, you know, the Fortnites and the, and the Apex Legends out there in this in this genre that you could go into if yeah. you decided it was the way to go? Like, uh, how do you guys see it? Yeah, you know, I think that ever since um, PUBG and, and Fortnite, we've definitely had, um, you know, people on social saying, like, we definitely want a Halo Battle Royale. I think that um, Vince and team did a great job with Apex Legends. And even within the studio, um, it, it maybe they've taken some pieces out that you could think about. You could see much more like, hey, you could do this with Halo. You know what I mean? Like, I think some of the things that they've done with Apex, like they kind of, for us, kind of feels a bit more like Halo. I will say that we have conversations all the time on like what the right uh, thing to do is. Whatever we do, we have a sandbox that gives us the ability to have multiple different game types. I'm not yeah. committing what the team wants to. I mean, that doesn't want to be a, a I think whatever we do needs to be the right thing for Halo. Sure. And so whether or not you call it a battle royale or how we're thinking about things going forward, the team definitely thinks about this needs to be right for Halo. And how does Halo evolve on, you know, we've got our arena. How are you looking at our bigger um, play? So it's, it's always an active conversation, but... Um, not <laughs> saying anything more about it. Well, right I mean, you know, you got to And look I do at think it. that Apex Legends, they've done a great job. It's super fun. So um, for Infinite, uh, well, how can I phrase it to you in a way that you might actually <laughs> speak might answer to it? you? <laughs> Maybe. Because um, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned Halo 4 coming in at the tail end of the 360 generation, and the original plan was to have it be a launch title on, on Xbox One. Uh, obviously Halo 4 turned out to be a great game and it sold well. Uh, would In your heart of hearts, would you have preferred it be a launch title for Xbox One? Yeah. Yes. Do you think it's... Imp so I was talking about this on our... We, you know, we do our weekly Xbox show yeah. Unlocked on IGN. I mean, it came up recently. I, I sort of never really thought about it until, until I went, wait a second. We've had three Xbox consoles so far, three you know generations, yeah. and only the first one actually launched with a with a Halo game. Do you think it's important for 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 Xboxes to, uh, or do you think it's important for Halo to launch to be a launch <laughs> title? Like, would you? You're trying to trick me. I, um, well, I do what I can. That's uh, my job. No, so when you look at so as you know, like <laughs> Halo CE um, launched with the platform, and. Um, 
Halo 2 tail end. I mean, at the time, there, there wasn't a lot of competition. So Halo 3 launching third year in, I think, was, was, was fine relative right, to the, and so the rest of the portfolio that we had on 360. And um, so I look at it more that when Halo is close with the platform, and I think we, we did kind of grow apart with the development of Xbox One, not because of any intentional thing on either the platform side or the Halo side, but I think that you can look at Halo 2 and multiplayer. So you can look at Halo 1 for playing the Xbox. You can get Halo 2, Xbox Live. Xbox Live. And um, I mean, Halo 3 was one of the biggest entertainment moments of all time, which is amazing. And I think we should have those moments. But I also think that when you do have a platform, it's really important to kind of have, like first party should be helping third party. Like we should be doing things that help create the best gaming ecosystem. And it works better when our big games um, are in sync with the different features that we're doing. Yeah. Whether or not that means if we were to do another console or anything like that, if we would be a launch. I think it's more, we've been working a lot closer and you know, since um, Scorpio, um, and Xbox One X have been, I think, a really. I think Phil's done an amazing job turning us back to where we are focused on games. And you see us and the platform teams and the studios are working closer than ever. So I feel really good about where we are there. Um, and that's where we are. <laughs> do you get? Do you get any? Do you get any? Or I guess there's, is it your decision ultimately, or or do do uh, higher ups in the Microsoft organization have any say in? In potentially aligning or in the in sort of the release window of Halo games, um, I would say that we have learned so much as an industry, like Phil, um, all of us, that it is important as first party that we need to have a good portfolio. But games also need to be great games, or yeah. it doesn't matter. Of course. And so, if you were to choose to launch a title with a um, a platform just hit that versus having a good game. I, you know, I think that we would make sure that we've got a great game. Well, that's also a relief to hear as a gamer. Though nothing will be, I mean, <laughs> nothing will be shoehorned and shoved out the door. Um, Infinite appears to be a uh, just. You know, we've only gotten one te sort of engine trailer to go off of, but the 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 tone that that conveys is that there seems to be a bit of a almost philosophical reboot to Halo. And you kind of yeah. almost, I feel like that's almost what you were saying a little while ago. And if not, not necessarily a narrative reboot, because you yeah. have said it's sort of effectively Halo 6. Um, who, who was the driving force at the studio on, on reshaping Halo to, with, with Infinite? As far as, you know, we, there's, there's clearly a, a new art direction here. Mm -hmm. There's... You know, obviously the new technology speaks to what you were talking about earlier with mm -hmm. rebuilding those tools and, yep. and investing in the creative side. So, um, yeah, kind of wh where did that, that this, this sort of new approach with, with Infinite come from within the studio? Yeah, and I would say, like, we kind of call it a spiritual reboot. That's kind of how uh, we talk about it. And um, I don't think there's any one person. I think that when you think about probably with any game team, a lot of people came to work at 343 because they're not just developers or creators, they're actually Halo fans. And so I think when you ask about learning, like did we have great learning moments with MCC? Yes. Um, with Halo 4 multiplayer? Yes. Um, with how we, um, you know, Halo 5 and the maps like for free and rec packs and kind of starting to um, really think about how we sustain our games longer. Um, I think with where we are with Halo, there's, there's just been a lot of introspective time to really reflect on, like, what have we done as 343, um, where have we made mistakes, where have we hit it right, and then what does Halo mean to all of us? And so I think it really is coming almost from a, like, what does Halo mean to all of us? And that uh, trailer that we did was that's what Halo means to the studio. And I think that you know maybe it took us two games to get there, and I think we've done good things and bad things um, on there, but what does Halo mean to us? And, and like, you know, it is about hope and wonder 
and heroism and humanity, you know, and, and community and bringing a community together. And that's what that trailer is. And, and that's what we want to do. Um, it, it's been, it has been, you know, a good while here. You know, there was no release date on that trailer. Certainly it was a, it was a engine show piece, you know, a tone piece. Um, unless you guys make a surprise at E3 this year saying it'll be out in 2019, I have to assume it's not. So, you know, the, that gap between five and infinite, what, have there, have there been any other versions of, of a Halo 6 between 5 and now? Or, or has it all, you know, that, that were maybe thrown away? Or, or is Infinite what's been going on this whole time? When we first um, were releasing Halo 5, uh, there were talks. And I think, you know, when you talk about um, pushing to get more Halos or pushing the dates or anything. There was talk about, like, could we get another Halo out in two years? And uh, On the Xbox One On the Xbox for One. For sure, yeah. And, um, and so we did look at sort of, I would call it like a Halo 5.5 yeah. or a Halo 6 ODST type of thing of a smaller game. We just investigated. I would say there was no dev sure. um, work on that. And I think it was a really good, um, like Phil and I had a really good discussion on where do we want Halo to go? Because if we really want Halo to be something that is for the next 10, 20 years, we have to do the work to actually build that foundation. If you want another game, we can do that. I don't think it's the right thing for the fans, and I think it is a truncated Halo game. And my concern was, which Phil agreed, is if we did something like that, I think it kind of... I think it... I think it I don't think that Halo would do well after that. Like, I don't think you can kind of put out um, what I would call a half-baked yeah. um, game on a franchise that's so um, important and, and do that unless we actually have the time or we had another team to go forth and do that while we're kind of working on Infinite. So it was a really good discussion with Phil. And Phil definitely said, I, like, I want the innovation. Um, you know, Halo is about innovation. And I think with Halo 5, we didn't get that feedback that maybe we had lost like people looking for what we're going to innovate on and and pushing it forward like they want what halo is and they want homage to halo but you also have to innovate and push it forward you know in talking with phil and and kind of weighing like do we want a halo 5.5 or do we want to invest in the future and um phil and i had a lengthy conversation on that and i had his full support on invest in the future, but not just investing in the future, thinking about as we invest in the future, um, how do we remain core to what is Halo? Um, and then how, so how do we innovate going forward? Yeah. If you look at every Halo, I think with the exception of, well, I think almost every Halo um, innovates on some level. And I think that that's really important, especially being part of the platform. Uh, Given the gap between five yeah. and, and infinite, and you know whatever the gap ends up being, is there? Do you think there's a, any anything extra riding on on infinite compared to previous games, or is it just like it all rides on every game? <laughs> I think it all rides on every game, but I also think that the work that the team has gone through, even like the cultural, it's probably been the hardest transition we've we've made to to get to this point. So I, I think this is a labor of love for the team, and I. Um, I think a lot rides on every Halo game, but I think this is taking the learnings that we've learned with everything we've done with Master Chief Collection, with Halo 4, with Halo 5, and, and maybe you know coming to a point in our future when we're kind of thinking about like what's the platform for the future of Halo? Like again, kind of looking at the stories over the next ten years, and, and Halo Infinite's the start of that. Uh, one more infinite question. I promise I'll leave you alone because I know you're not. You know, this is not a game that you've, you, you've you're really talking much about yet. But you just you said something earlier when you're talking about re investing in those tools, and now you've, you've rebuilt a new engine yeah. for this. What creatively? Like, what will? What does Slip Space allow? Well, what will that allow your team to do that they couldn't do before? I'm sort of curious from a. You know, not not from like a literal yeah. technical granular level. I know it's you know this isn't the time or place for that, but 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 more from a I guess a design kind of bigger picture perspective. Yeah, and on this one, I I am like Chris Lee will talk about this um, at E3. So Chris Lee is the um, head of the Infinite team, and I kind of would save that for E3. Fair enough. Sorry. I have to try. <laughs> I have to try while you're here. 
Uh, well, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what that video game is all about. Um, so both both Halo Wars games, uh, the second one was under your umbrella. Halo Wars 2 came under the 343 umbrella, uh, and that was uh, Creative Assembly, of course. It was well received. It's a good game. What are we are we going to see uh, any other non first person shooter Halos at some point? Was that do you do you see the Halo Wars games as as kind of experiments or one offs or or will Halo continue to branch out yeah. uh, and and you know not just on mobile uh, not not to discount mobile but yeah. you know on Xbox can we look forward to any other sort of alternative Halo experiences at some point down the way? Yeah, and Halo, um, Halo Wars is the first one. Um, ensemble, that was Ensemble that did that, but right. we were still, we were kind of, it kind of fell under the 343 oh, okay. stuff as well during that time. Um, but, and I think an Ensemble was an, was an incredibly talented team, and that, sure. was, um, that was great. When, when I look at where we are right now, um, and we've done a lot of investment on MCC, and making sure that we have that in a good state and we continue to listen to fans on that and that we need to get infinite right. You know, and so that's the focus. And so like when, I, when we talk to the team, it's like I said, we've got this canvas that we can tell so many different stories and we can tell different game genres. And the answer is, um, yeah, it's not it's like if, but when. And now is not the right time. Yeah. But yeah, like I would love to tell... Um, different stories through different genres. And I think the team, the, you know, we have hackathons and there's a ton of ideas from the team. And so I think that, you know, let's deliver Infinite and then let's see what we do in the future. Well, one of those projects, I'm just curious to ask you, you have com- you've commented on this publicly before, but the, the Halo Mega Blocks project, mm-hmm. where did that come from? And uh, what what is the decision? I mean, obviously the decision is not to continue the project, but is that, uh, could you just talk a little bit about that? Like, that, that's that's a kind of a le- out of left field thing that I think your average Halo fan wouldn't have, have expected. Yeah. yeah so that um, probably you're talking about Hagar, the codename Hagar yes. one. So um, that was a project that I think I think happens a, a, a lot in games. It the graphical look and the thought of doing a more whimsical Halo, you know, and Frank worked really hard to kind of make sure that we carved out a part in the universe where it would be okay for us to tell a little bit off-canon stories. Yeah. Uh, but it appealed so much to the studio, like when we would look at the builds. But um, it did not have creative direction and vision that was going. And we probably kept that project going a year more than we should because we wanted it to yeah. To be something like everyone could make their own game when you would get it. It didn't have a lot of gameplay when we were playing at the beginning, but you could see and what it could be. But we didn't have a designer that actually um, really was able to own it and drive it. So it stayed alive longer than it should have. But I think that it touched something in all of us. Like, you know, that um, it was just like a more whimsical, uh, fun Halo with, that still was like had a Halo feel but maybe took it in a little bit different direction that was right. that would appeal to both you know kind of like the lego games that appeal to both adults and and kids so um that definitely still holds a place in the heart of many people in the studio well something uh, else in the in the halo universe we've been waiting a long long time for is this showtime television series <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> you're here i have to ask you about it i know last last we heard it's shooting i think later this fall uh how Involved are you guys? Is uh, I guess Kiki Wolfkill yes, on your team? Kiki and, and Frank are very involved. And um, yeah, what's what sort of like how much creative o- ownership are you guys taking over it versus you know letting kind of Showtime do TV things with it? Yeah, TV things. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it's a it's a little bit of a combination of both. I think if anything, we've learned. Um, and I think we've always done a, a pretty good job of letting different artists interpret um, Halo. Like you can look at Halo Legends, which is the anime anthology, and we gave um, the creators like some guidelines. Yeah. Um, and then Frank worked really closely with them, and there was some stuff that went crazy. Like oh, it was some, great. That some, was a great collection. But the ones that got canceled, there's some oh. that got held back. Like I think there was like some love or marriage in the sky in one of them. That Frank was like, I think that's taking it a little bit too far. But all in all, like when we um, let other people um, t- 
take uh, our franchise, we kind of want to see it on a different medium. We want to see it through a different creative lens. We're not TV people. We're not um, animated, like anime um, creators or live action creators. But there is an important thing on how do you kind of think about and manage the canon and, and how we're looking through that. And so I think it's a, it's a fine balance because what works in a game um, doesn't necessarily work in TV. And and how do you kind of do I think Marvel does a good job of kind of creating everything works together and audiences are, are OK, but you've you've got some different pieces. And I think we're trying to, to learn that as well. We do have a lot of experience, but it is Showtime is a great partner. And Frank and Kiki are incredibly um, involved in all the scripts and feedback and you know we will have just like all of our um, other pieces we will have people on site um, on our team to kind of make sure that you've got the canon going where the canon should go but well, it's oh so sorry good. no go ahead no, it's just i think when you have a different medium i think you have to do the right thing for the medium and you have to be precious about some parts of the universe and, and canon, and I think you have to do what's right for the TV there. So we're kind of walking through that right now, and, and hopefully, you know, we've got great writers. Um, Showtime's great, and well, well how about on the on the movie side? I mean, that the 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 original you know Halo yes. movie pitch thing is like the stuff of Hollywood legend now. Um, is that is that something that's uh, on the back burner? Is it a, is it in the thinking for you guys at all? Now, when we looked at. Um, and again, so the Showtime, I think we announced it five years ago. Oh, it's been a while. It's been <laughs> um, a while. When we were looking at where we were going to go, we were making a decision between movie or, or television. And I think both are important. I think that's something that both ultimately we want fans to experience. One of the things that was appealing to us about television was when you're looking at premium television, it enables you to actually do a lot more character development over time. And so I think that's incredibly interesting for us on, on, on being able to tell longer, deeper stories. I think the movie is also really interesting to us. You usually wouldn't have them at the same time. So we're focusing on the TV one as well. But I think that even within the studio, having a great Halo movie is, I think, something we all want as well. Uh, a couple more, and I promise I will let you go. Yeah. Um, just what what do you hope that your legacy is in, in this industry when whenever the day comes that you decide that, that you've had enough and you're done? Like what do wow. you think about? I mean, twenty five years is you know you got pl you got plenty of time left, but it's also you know you've done a lot too. So I'm sort of curious how you think of uh, what what you hope your your uh, legacy is that you leave behind. Gosh. Um... That's an interesting question, and um, maybe I'll go back to a story when um, my one of my first E3s, where uh, we had um, full court press, PC game. Um, we had a little basketball court, um, stadiums where like these huge monitors on each side where you, um, you could play, and when we were setting up, Steven Spielberg walked across my basketball court, and. Uh, I'm, he was probably looking for the bathroom or whatever, but this this light bulb went off in my head, which is also one of the reasons I would say I, I stayed in gaming, where I was asking myself, well, what is he seeing? Like, he's a movie guy, and he actually likes games, so he probably was there. He brings his kids all the time. Yeah. But in my mind, and the story I made up, was when you look at entertainment overall, is will the technology that we have today actually start to merge forms of entertainment? And will you stop thinking about what is a game and what is just entertainment. And I'm not like saying um, we ever should be linear entertainment. Like we own like being interactive entertainment, but like storytelling and where it's evolving. And what I would say when I hope my legacy and like my interest in Halo and in transmedia, I hope that technology and storytelling um, and being able to create experiences where users are actually in control of the entertainment and the experiences and it um, is something that we actually get to and I hope that when we look back that you see the work that not just we're doing but that I think many different studios are doing as we kind of look at the future on where entertainment all up is going and I think that technology empowering storytelling in a way that um, we haven't been able to tell before I think is something that 
I thought we'd be further along, but um, it's, it's hugely inspiring to think about how we want to experience entertainment going forward. And I think that gaming as it is today, when you think about it from 20 years, I think it's going to be very different. And, and I'm not even sure we'll, we'll, we'll think of it as anything except for how we're experiencing entertainment. Yeah, good stuff. Bonnie I'm Ross. Not sure, so I'm not sure that's a, like, <laughs> what I would say my legacy or anything like that, but I would say that I am super passionate on like what technology does to change an art form. Bonnie Ross, Hall of Famer. <laughs> Get used to that sound, Hall of Famer. Uh, Bonnie Ross, the studio head at 343. Thank you so much Thank for you. sitting down and doing this. Thanks. And congratulations on your honor. It is absolutely well-deserved. Uh, we can't wait to see Halo Infinite and what your studio and what you and your team come up with next. Uh, Bonnie Ross, studio head at 343. For more on the best, brightest, and most interesting minds in the games industry, be sure to tune in to IGN Unfiltered every month. You can find it on IGN YouTube or your favorite podcast service. Thank you.